Watercraft is the knowledge or understanding of bodies of water, how they behave and where you're likely to find fish on any given day. In this video, we're going to look at how to find fish on both lakes and rivers. So there are a few bits of kit that will help you in your journey to finding and locating fish. One of those, and probably the most important, are polarizing sunglasses. Any old sunglasses help because they you know, cut out the glare and stop you from squinting. But the polarized ones specifically cut out that glare on the surface of the water. On a larger body of water where you need to be looking right out into the distance or scanning a far margin, trying to see signs of fish, binoculars can also be key. I personally don't own a pair of binoculars. Uh, Alex, however, likes his bird watching and stuff. He's got a pair and has actually spotted signs of fish at range when I sat on the bank, haven't been able to. So it's worth considering if you're fishing somewhere quite large, potentially there's a, a snaggy far margin that you wanna like peer into and get a bit closer up. Binoculars can be a massive edge. But what exactly are you going to be looking for? What do you want to see to know that there's fish in a certain area of the lake? Well, first of all, there's fish crashing. That's a very obvious one. When, uh, when a fish jumps clear of the water, uh, to either clean its gills or to try and rid itself of parasites, it becomes very easy to spot. Um, if you see a fish crash out in front of you in winter, especially when the fish are very tightly shoaled up, there could be a lot more fish in that area. This is why in the sort of early spring and winter, if we see a fish show, we'll always try and put a rod on it because you can get a quick bite as there may be a, a large shoal of fish beneath that particular one. The other thing you can look for are bubbles popping on the surface. However, there are a few different types of bubbles. It's a myth that, that fish will just swim around blowing bubbles. That doesn't really work like that. Most of the bubbles that you see popping on the surface on a lake in front of you are actually because the, uh, the bottom of the lake, where there's leaf debris and weeds and rotting down stuff, it releases uh, methane gas as it rots and those bubbles will naturally come up to the surface eventually. The trick is to know what sort of bubbles are fish and what sort of bubbles are just weeds and stuff like that. So if you see a few just big bubbles, bloop, 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 in a line, all coming up from one point, that is almost certainly just the lake bed releasing some trapped methane gas from the rotting substrate. However, if there's bubbles that are sort of popping in an erratic fashion, in a little, in a little spread, and maybe they're moving, also, if they're a little bit smaller bubbles, then that is almost always fish disturbing the bubbles on the bottom. The other thing that you might sometimes see is very, very small bubbles uh, that are actually coming up from weed beds. Plants that are in the water photosynthesize, they convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. When that oxygen is released, they will come up to the surface. We see it in our fish tank. It's called purling, where the plant releases little tiny bubbles of oxygen that can sometimes look a bit like fish, but you'll know that it's not because it's very consistent, very, very small bubbles all coming up from uh, you know, a, a large area. So what you're looking for are erratic bubbles that are maybe moving around, little patches of them, and different size bubbles means that those fish are you know, rooting around in the, in the substrate, disturbing the, uh, the, the, the gases, and that's what's coming up to the surface. If the fish are feeding hard and they're disturbing the silt or clay, let's say, on the bottom, they can also not only release bubbles, but also kick up a, a slight color to the water, a, dis, a discoloration of the water. It's most noticeable on clear lakes. You'll go for a few swims and it'll be like crystal clear water. And then you get to one and you're like, mm, can't quite see the bottom. And that's because the fish have potentially disturbed the, uh, you know, the, the mud and dirt on the bottom and it's clouded up the water. If you can find churned up sort of chocolatey colored water, you're probably not far away from, from feeding fish. Another thing that's worth looking out for is baby fish. You probably won't be fishing for these fry or tiny roach, let's say, but if you find those shoals of little fish, there's often likely to be bigger fish nearby, especially if you're seeing little fry scattering on the surface or shoals of roach darting past, then there's probably a perch or a pike not far away as well. The final thing that we keep our eyes out for, and it's a little bit less noticeable, uh, is flat spots on the water's surface. So you'll often get a ripple on the surface, but then sometimes it will just suddenly just go flat in a little circle and then it will go ripply again. Normally that indicates that a fish has swam along underneath the surface, 
pushed its tail, disturbed the water, and the water sort of billowed up towards the surface and created a flatter spot before the ripples returned. That's a good sign. That probably means there's fish moving in the area. The other thing that you'll sometimes see is uh, ripples going across the lake and then a large patch where there is no ripples. Like the ripples are there, it goes flat, and then they start again. This is what you call a, a flat spot. Flat spots, they can be caused by a number of things. If there's a spring beneath the surface that's bubbling water up, uh, that can cause it. But the most common cause on most uh, you know, fisheries is when someone has put out some bait with quite a lot of oil in it, so maybe halibut pellets or a ground bait or something, and then a fish disturbs that oil or the oil, uh, the oil is released over time by the pellets and the oil creates, uh, uh, adjusts the surface tension. So the ripples sort of disappear and it becomes flat. You'll notice when you're surface fishing with dog biscuits um, that you cover in you know, vegetable oil, for example, you can flatten off the surface and the ripples will go away. But that's worth looking out for because sometimes if fish begin feeding on your baited up spot, you'll know that because it will suddenly just go flat over the top of it. That's something worth looking for and can help you understand what's going on beneath the surface. But what about the occasions where you can't see any signs of fish? Well, you're gonna to need to use other information to work out where those fish are likely to be. The biggest bit of information that I'd like to talk about is depth. Depth of water is really, really vital for a number of reasons. The first thing is that shallow water warms up quicker and deep water holds its heat for longer. Fish being cold blooded want to sit where the water is warmest most of the time and therefore in early spring when the sun first starts hitting the water and starts to warm it up the fish will naturally gravitate towards the shallower part of the lake because they can get more warmth there. Later on in the year, when it starts to get colder, you know, it's autumn time, the nights are quite chilly, that surface water gets cold quickly and therefore the fish are likely to move out of it into water that is deeper and therefore more well insulated and stays warm for longer. Now that's all well and good but how do you work out how deep the water is? Well we have made a video on this channel all about how to use a marker float, a braided, uh, a rod with braid on and a lead to find out the depths in front of you so we'll put a link to that video in the description uh, to the, of this one. If you don't have a rod on you to check the exact depths, you can get a rough idea by looking at the surrounding area around the lake. For example, here we've got a valley that has been flooded to build the lake. What they've done is they've built a dam at one end and there's a stream that flows in at the other. You will almost certainly find the shallowest water where the inlet is, where the stream comes in or the spring is, and then down at the other end, you'll find the deepest water next to the dam. This is because of the shape of a valley before the dam is built. You won't be able to use this sort of uh, information if you're fishing on a lake that's just been dug in the middle of a field by diggers, because it doesn't follow the same um, you know, format. But it's worth looking around the dam of a lake if there is one, if you're trying to find deep water, and inlet if you're trying to find the shallows. The other thing about inlets is that they bring fresh water into the lake that you're fishing. That fresh water can hold food, but it can also hold a slightly different temperature, maybe more oxygen than the rest of the lake. One thing that we've found about inlets is that in the height of summer, when it's really, really hot, oxygen levels in a lake can really decline. Those fish will need oxygen to breathe, and you can often find much more oxygenated water where the inlet flows into a lake. So if the lake that you're fishing has got a stream flowing into it, a waterfall, a spring bubbling up, or any sort of like water movement, fresh water coming in, that is an amazing place to look, especially on early mornings in the summer. That is one of the biggest bits of information we've ever learned, is inlets are an amazing place to find fish uh, on, a, on a hot uh, summer morning, because that's when the oxygen levels in the rest of the lake are at their lowest. If you're struggling to locate fish, then good places to focus on are areas they could hide in, such as weeds, lily pads, overhanging trees and snags. Before we head off to the river and look at how to find fish in flowing water, there's one more thing that I want to mention that affects still waters. That is wind. When the wind blows on the surface, it will push whatever water is near the top across the lake 
into the, into the margins. When it reaches the margins, it will then be pushed across the bottom and it will flow back across the lake near the bottom. This is why sometimes you can cast a float out and the float actually goes the opposite. It drags the opposite direction to the wind. This is known as undertow. Now, on a day like today, when the sun is on the surface, it's warming up that surface water, you kind of want the wind blowing in your face because the wind will be blowing the warm water towards you and therefore the fish will probably follow that. The wind also pushes food, natural food like bugs, insects, uh, across the water as well and that, that food will accumulate uh, where the wind is blowing into. So it's worth having the wind blowing towards you if you want you know, the best of both worlds in that respect. But there's one time where the wind really works against you and that's when the surface of the water is cooling down. If it's been warm for a while and it suddenly started getting cold, then that surface water is cooling down. And if the wind is blowing towards you, blowing cold surface water in towards your bank, that's probably a bad thing. So a general rule is to say that if it's cold, you want the wind on your back. And if it's warm, you want the wind on your front. Fish, they're not always that predictable. Sometimes you won't be able to follow those rules, but it's a good place to start. Now that we are on a river, the main thing to think about is the speed of the flow. This is because certain species prefer to sit in fast flows and others like to conserve their energy and sit in slower water. Barbel, chub, grayling, trout, they're all species that require lots of oxygen and they're also species that are quite happy to sit in fast flowing water and fight against the flow all day long, waiting for food you know, to wash down that they can eat. On the other hand, if you're trying to catch uh, pike, perch, tench, bream, carp, those are all fish that are a lot more keen to sit in slower, deeper water where they don't have to fight against the flow. The way to find sort of deeper and shallower areas on a river is of course you can cast around with your lead and count how long it takes to hit the bottom. But you can also look at the way the, the, way the flow is because that can kind of tell you quite a lot about what's going on beneath the surface. So on a, a bend on a river, the flow on the outside of the bend will move faster as it pushes across. The main, the main like, flow of the river will push across to the outside and will race around the outside of a bend. Meanwhile, the water on the near side will slow right down. This slower area is where you want to look for, you know, uh, carp, pike, uh, bream, the species that prefer those slower areas. The other thing about the fast flowing water on the outside of a bend is that it will often dig out the bottom. It will um, erode the, the riverbed. And what that results in is some deeper water normally on the outside of a bend. What I've got behind me is a man-made structure, a weir pool. And in a, in a weir pool, you'll get lots of different habitats for lots of different fish, all in quite a small area. For example, barbel will definitely like to hang around where the highly oxygenated water is, uh, around the sill of the weir. On the other hand, if you're looking for pike, I would probably consider this deeper margin here where there's less flow, the fish don't have to fight against the flow, and they've also got large structures where bait fish will probably be hiding. So keep an eye on what the depths are and what the speed of the river is. The other thing is that if you've had a lot of rain and the river is quite flooded and it's racing through, then you're probably best off looking for areas where the fish can sort of hide away from all the sticks and leaves and rubbish that is coming down in those fast flooded rivers. The other thing is that if you try and fish in a flooded river, your line will get hit by lots of twigs and leaves and stuff and that can be quite annoying. Where I'm actually sitting here is exposed, it's not beneath the water, but if we had a lot of rain and the river came up a lot, this little sheltered area would be somewhere you could probably fish because the fish would come into here to shelter from the fast flooded river. You could also control your bait better and present your bait more easily too. Another place to look when the river is flooded is a side stream or tributary. The main river will often be raging in winter when you've had a lot of flooding and many of the fish will seek shelter in the sort of smaller side streams that join the main river. Those areas can be full of fish like roach, perch and actually the pike follow in those silverfish when the river is in flood. As I said at the beginning of this video, watercraft is a tricky thing to learn because only really with time 
do you truly understand how all the different species behave and where you're likely to find them on any given day. But hopefully this video has given you an insight into what sort of things to look for and where to start when trying to locate fish. I definitely advise checking out the video on screen now which will teach you how to check the depths with a marker flow or lead on the end of your rod. Finding the depths will definitely help with locating fish on your next session.